all of you for coming. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I probably don't even need the mic. I'm such a loud mouth. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. And for those of you who uh, helped support the crowdfunding of this film, a big thank you. How many people help, help contribute to the film? Quite a few of you. Thank you very much. You know, this was the um, largest crowdfunded film in uh, documentary film in the history of the world, not just Hollywood. And um, it's a testament to how many people are concerned about this issue. And there are a couple of people in particular I want to thank. Uh, very special thanks go to uh, Chris Debney here. He's a director and uh, is again ready to do a new science fiction film. And we talked at lunch about doing a non-science fiction film on this <laughs> that would be kick-ass awesome. All right, so that's the next project, right, okay. Chris? And another person I have special thanks I want to I have is to uh, a Thomas Clearwater. Mr. Clearwater, where are you? There he is. to uh, the film Sirius, and uh, without his assistance, the film would not have gotten completed. I can say this with authority. So thank you. Now many people say, what do you think about your film? It's not my film. I don't make films. I defibrillate people and brief world leaders and lead the disclosure project and make contact with ETs. But I don't make films. <laughs> Can't do everything. <laughs> so, uh, Armani Kalika approached me about a year and a half ago, and he says, I love your work, and he'd won an Emmy in, uh, for a documentary. And I said, well, let's do it. Do you have any funding? He says, no. I said, well, let's see if we can ask the public if they want to fund it. And they did. You did. And what's been interesting about the rollout of this film, which is still in its early stages, it's all crowdfunded rollout, in the last three months, is that it was one of the largest premieres in Los Angeles history. Wow. We had everyone from Paul up here. <laughs> about five million people learned of it through the Huffington Post before they trashed the issue about this little body that you're going to see in here. By the way, we still don't know what it is. A correction to that, the geneticist in the film says it's male, now we don't know the gender. I figure maybe, well, maybe it's gay, or, or I don't know, who cares? Uh, but there, it's not coming up male or female, which is kind of cool. Um, after the Q&A the Q&A part, I'm going to go into this in more depth. Um, so it, there's a lot happening, and one of the great things that are happening as a consequence of the film is that uh, the, there's a group of world leaders that meet privately on an island in the Great Barrier Reef every year. Um, and I have to go there next month to provide an in-depth three-day briefing to these world leaders on this subject and how to get us all oil and how to start a new civilization and how to fix the environmental problem with something beyond freaking solar. So there really are wonderful things happening and it's all about raising awareness and you know this could not have been done when we first did the National Press Club event 12 years ago, and about 800 million people saw it, but the internet was not developed where it is now. Now anyone can get online, and they can go to you can go to seriousdisclosure.com, and you can see the film, you can tell people about it, you can see all the CAT scans of this beam. You, we're loading up dozens and dozens of top secret military uh, witness testimonies that we couldn't have done before. I have 110 hours. Nobody wants to look at 110 hours, but <laughs> an Uber nerd like me. But 110 hours of top secret military uh, testimony, documents, et cetera, and so on. So this is all going up on that site. So go to seriousdisclosure.com and, and see what's going up. It's an enormous website. And I think that the, the film is really, I call it a portal. It's a doorway into learning about the subject in general. But it, it's not the definitive story. You have to understand that the director had an hour and 50 minutes. It was his first look at this subject. He didn't know anything about it, really. 
And so it's his take on kind of my life and, and the work we've done. Um, and he introduces a huge number of subjects in this small amount of time, but he does it very beautifully, I believe. So I think you'll enjoy the film. And you know, he did this after his uh, father was shot at the uh, Sikh temple, as you know, in the mass, uh, uh, mass shooting that we have every other day in America. And uh, you all know this story. And, um, so you know, the director of the film's father was the first guy shot at the Sikh temple in Wisconsin. And so it almost killed the film in August. And we got it back on track. And so there have been all kinds of, of vicissitudes getting this far. But we made it. And uh, within one year, we conceived of the film, raised the funds, shot it, completed it, and rolled it out. And that's really thanks to all of you guys. So I really do want to thank you and Mr. Clearwater and also Chris Debney. What we're going to, to see here over the next uh, hour and 50 minutes is, is really a tour de force introduction. And then afterwards, I'll come back up here for about an hour for Q&A and discussion. And uh, any of your questions, you can shout them out. And I have a number of things I'm going to cover. But uh, until then, enjoy the show. And again, thank you for coming. God bless. The problem is not proving that UFOs exist, it's when you begin to expose the energy and propulsion systems behind how they're getting here. What scientists need to do is they need to look at the hardcore evidence, decide that, oh my gosh, ETs are real, and then get over that. Then you can start extrapolating. These sciences have been around for decades. They have been ruthlessly kept secret because of the power of a centralized petrodollar oil gas coal system. And right now these misanthropic sociopaths are running the planet into the ground. Governments have not gone far enough so we've decided that as people to form our own movement. All right, game on. What we are attempting to achieve is a device which defeats the perpendicular force of gravity. We have so many modes of converting quantum vacuum energy or zero point energy. This possible EVE was found in the Atacama Desert. We have the best scientists that are going to be doing the DNA testing. We have 1150 teams of CE5 ambassadors. I can attest to the fact that real phenomenon happens here. And this is probably the most important thing going on on this planet today and yet nobody talks about it. If we come together we can make this happen in a matter of months, not decades. For this is the destiny of humanity.
that's about 0.01% of what we're doing. And it gives you a sense of the journey we've been on. And so I, I, I really would welcome you to ask whatever questions you have about what you've seen in here, about the research, about contact, about the technologies, about consciousness. Those are the areas that I, that I love focusing on. So anyone who has a question, shout it out. Dr. Greer. Yes. Are we Homo sapiens hybrid? Are Homo sapiens hybrid? I'll repeat the question. Um, you know, I met with an NSA official quite a few years ago who told me, and I can't verify this, that there were, um, over the years, over the couple million years, that there have been 64 peri, uh, epigenetic augmentations of the genome resulting in you know, Homo sapiens. Now, scientifically what that means, epi, everybody know what epigenetics is? Okay, okay. Um, you, we have our DNA, and the big forefront of genetics is what are the effects that are in the environment, even in thought, meditative states, that turn on and off what used to be called junk DNA. And now they're finding that in fact it's not junk DNA, that uh, these other, this other genetic code lights up and turns on and off depending on environmental or epigenetic influences. So the question becomes, there's much more to us than meets the eye from the Human Genome Project. Um, now, you know, no one can prove at this point uh, how it is that Homo sapiens came to their modern state. There's a gap missing um, that's known scientifically. Um, and, and the other question is, if the, the study that just came out, it's actually on our website, uh, seriousdisclosure.com, that says that if you were to take the natural evolutionary pattern, our genetics should have taken about 10.5 billion years to just evolve through evolutionary theory. But the Earth is only 4.5 billion years old. So I'm messing that up. And this is in a mainstream uh, genetics journal. So, the, the, you know, there are many mysteries locked within us, within the Earth, and what have you. And this is what we're running into um, with this little creature that you saw. Um, now, unfortunately, the media, um, which don't generally have good scientific people on their staff, <laughs> uh, no offense to any media here, but uh, <laughs> the geneticists at Stanford, no geneticist is going to say that's an extraterrestrial biological entity, what's called an EBE, uh, because there's no genetic uh, database. So the way the genetics were done on that, just so you all know, is that let's say um, you know the Human Genome Project was done there outside DC, um, and I know people who worked on it. You had about uh, over a decade, billions of dollars, and they finally figured out the human genome. Now what they did was take 2,500 ethnic racial groups from all over the world, put it into a database, which is now computerized. When I clipped, when you saw where it took the ribs, the anterior lower rib off the right side of this little uh, creature, and when we took that, I could see we had good bone marrow. So we were able to get a very perfect sample. It was not degraded. It was not like CSI where you have to do a lot of PCR, polymerase change reaction replication where you get a lot of error. Very pure. Uh, although we think it's 100 or 200 years old, it was very good. Um, DNA. So what that was, it was processed as older DNA, what's called ancient DNA, which means from a corpse. Doesn't mean thousands of years old. That's the term used in genetics, ancient. Ancient being more than 50 years. <laughs> and, or not fresh. I mean, your blood, my blood, yours would be fresh DNA. So, okay, I know everyone, I'm, everyone's going to glaze over because I'm a nerd and I'm going to go into some science here. So, I just look stupid. So, <laughs> My, my bodybuilding buddies, you know, I bench press 410, they go, you know, you're not as stupid as you look. I said, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, outrageous person. But, so we looked into this, and, and when they ran it, again, at the three top labs in the world, and it was headed up by Stanford, 91% matched to human, 9% matched to nothing, unmatched. Now, 
Of course, you can say, if it was a bad sample, you could say, well, it was all computer error, junk DNA, what have you, but this was not a bad sample. So the genetics team have, have privately told me the expectation would have been 2 or 3 percent, high number 4 or 5 percent. Now, just so all of you know, um, we're 96 to 97 percent identical to chimpanzees. Neanderthals are 99.5 percent identical to humans and business to some guys even more so. So, <laughs> so <laughs> Neanderthals. So <laughs> when you look at that, if half of that unmatched DNA is what's called an operational gene, that would make that creature more different from us than we are from chimps. Now people say, well why don't you know? I said because the easy part was taking the sample flying to Barcelona, running it through these computerized databases. Now, what we have to do, and I'm, I'm going to make this announcement here in London, uh, first time. We're going to have, a, there's a big, huge biotech company called Ingenuity, huge. They're going to offer a major cash prize to thousands of PhDs all over the world. We're going to dump the database into access to these PhD geneticists so that they can pick through the two million base pairs that are unmatched. The question is, why is that much unmatched? Wasn't a bad sample, certainly not compute, all computer error. Um, and the bigger mystery, which you may have picked up in here, is that this is a six to eight year old creature, but it's six inches, 13 centimeters. Now, I can tell you as an emergency doctor, I've delivered many premature babies that have come out, you know, one push and they're out, you know. But you know, they're this big, or this big, they're not that big. They're not the size of a 15 to 18 year old uh, fetus. Uh, but if you look at the epiphyseal plates, which is what the top expert in the world, Stanford, looked at, it's six to eight years old. So there's an enigma here wrapped in a mystery, math, you know, just completely unknown. We hope that if we set loose thousands of PhD geneticists around the world at the best institutions, they will be able to pick through these two million base pairs, which could be up to a thousand genes, and figure out what's going on with this specimen. And nobody knows yet. I can't tell you it's ET, but no one can tell you it's actually human either. Because something's not adding up. Now since the film came, was completed in early April, it was just completed. We found out that there are two or three more of these. One in Russia that was confiscated by the KGB, the FSB, back in 1996. I have a video of it. Another one that's in Chile that's three inches big, that's just like this creature. And another one that was found in Puerto Rico. Now, if we can get access to the genetics of any of those and they match up to this one, it's case closed. Now, the, now, now, to ask, you know, you're going to find when you ask a question, I'm going to go off into deeper and deeper issues that are disturbing. And, and <laughs> you know, as, as uh, Gloria Steinem said, the truth will set you free. First, it will piss you off. <laughs> so, so, Vatican, close your ears, and the fundamentalist Christians, because here I'm going to say something. It appears that in this creature, there is what's called the B2. B as in boy, 2A allele. Now what that allele is, is that it matches to the native people of that part of the world in Chile on the female mitochondrial DNA. Well, what is that doing in those women, or what is it doing in this creature if it's not human, if it's not a homo sapien? And the, what you begin to realize is that if you go to these areas, where there are the Nazca lines, where there are the Mayan and Inca, cultures where there are drawings and petroglyphs and in their tradition they had ancient contact with people from the stars. Mm -hmm. I believe your Celtic and Gaelic people here did. I think the ancient Egyptians did, is in my own view. But <coughs> is it possible that there was some genetic commingling that happened 50, 100,000, 200,000 years ago? Probably. And so what we're going to have to do is map these alleles. Now, this is going to rock. I mean, you can imagine the people who are not going to be happy. All archaeology, 
all historians, all anthropology, all conventional genetic thinking, evolutionary thinking, not to mention jet propulsion labs. And that's why this is so explosive and why we're going to run it to the ground as much as we can. How long will that take? I would estimate between two and five years, unfortunately. Uh, because now is the hard part. You have to go through two million base pairs and pick them out one by one. Keep in mind, it, in a normal genetic study, if you don't know what a, a, a grouping of DNA is doing, you do what's called a mouse study. Because mice and me, my, of mice and men, were 70% identical genetically. So what is normally done at a place like Stanford or Harvard, MIT, I don't know, maybe Cambridge, is that you would take a, a genetic series, you put it, snip it, replicate it, put it into a mouse, and see what it does. Each one of those studies, and we may have to do a thousand of them, is at least $500,000 per mouse study. So that's $500 million. I'm not walking around with that kind of money. The United States government does. Maybe your government does, but they're all bankrupt. Uh, but uh, we'll just print more. We'll ask Bernanke to print up <laughs> So this becomes a daunting task for this one genetics lab, even though it's a, one of the premier labs in the world. And this particular scientist, Dr. Nolan, um, you know, he has like 40 PhDs working under him. He, he, he's, he's an absolute genius. But it's beyond what he can take on. Uh, he's an endowed chair there. And he was able to do this work for us uh, pro bono for free because he had discretionary funds under his endowment as, as an endowed chair at Stanford. So we have a great debt of gratitude to, to Dr. Nolan. Um, so that's the big part. I think a more interesting part is the clinical picture. Because the people I've run into since this has come out in the last uh, 60 days are some people who went down there to where this creature was found, and they found in some of the old mining areas where they had uh, were digging in the late 1800s, they would cut into <coughs> what were these underground cities. And apparently, Ed Snowden, the NSA leaker, put out in part of his thing that there were, there were, were documents dealing with ultra-terrestrials that were ETs that had taken up residence on Earth and were living underground, which is what they're called. Um, if true, that would be interesting. So what we really need to do, we need to go to the Atacama Desert, we need to have ground penetrating radar, ultrasound, archaeology, da 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 da, but it's you know, beyond the scope of our funding at this point. And if I had it, I'd have to make the decision between that and opening a new energy lab, which is what we really want to do, so we could say goodbye to oil and coal, and nuclear power, and the grid. You know, uh, this film was really conceived as a fundraiser and an awareness building project so that we could transition out of the 1800s <coughs> where we are stuck. Our civilization is stuck in the mid to late 1800s. Your car engine, 1880s Mercedes. The electric grid, 1800s late 1800s. Look at photographs of London and New York in the late 1800s with the wires. Coal-fired power plants, same thing. Nuclear power plants, it's just heat from splitting an atom, but you're running a steam turbine just like the 1800s, choo-choo trains going across the west. Jet engines, all right, 1930s. Rockets, Werner von Braun dropping V2 rockets on London here, 1940s. We're stuck 70 to 80 years retarded. So this is why our civilization is dying, because there are a bunch of petro-Nazis and kleptocrats that have kept this sort of thing secret, not because people are going to hurl themselves off the big bin because there's intelligent life out there. 75% of the public already thinks that there's likely intelligent life out there. In America, 43% of Americans believe ETs are already here on Earth somewhere. So I don't think it's going to be any huge shock the shock is going to be to your 200 vertically and horizontally integrated corporate behemoths, Goldman Sachs and what have you, that are going to say goodbye to the $600 trillion in oil, gas, coal, nuclear power, utilities, internal combustion engines, jet engines. It's the end of the world as we know it and the beginning of a new civilization. I'm using the R.E.M. song as the end of the world as we know it, but I feel fine. You know, I love that song. So, you know, it's like, okay, let's move on. Uh, but that's really the issue. Uh, but, so two issues 
that are behind the secrecy. One is ecclesiastical and paradigm. Where did we come from? How long have we had contact? From whence has Homo sapiens arisen? And the other one is just raw macroeconomic power. Because no cartel and power base wants to go the way of all flesh, which they would. Um, they'd be like royal typewriters. You don't need them. Everybody's got a smartphone, hook up the internet. <laughs> All right, so it, it is a whole new beginning for our civilization, and that is something uh, I'm on the side of advocating. There are other people who let me be quiet. But what I think is really going to be important is that all of you spread the word, we get the funding in place to open a lab. Now people say, how are you going to get away with this more than Tesla did? I said, well, this is not the age of Tesla. We put this lab online and stream it on Ustream. And so when the Nazis come goose-stepping in with a national security order to seize it, we got, gotcha, on candid camera, screw you. <laughs> and, no, I mean, you know, there was this show, ABC News Nightline, I don't know if you've heard of it, uh, Ted Koppel, the great guy, I, I was talking to him years ago about this. He says, well, what would you do if you acquired one of these technologies? So I say, well, I come on all of these shows I've been on, like yours and Larry King's and all these and I tear it up in front of millions of people and say, come and put on the handcuffs. You want to put the bracelets on? Be prepared to have white all burned to the ground and the White House burned to the ground. People aren't going to stand for this once they see the solution. So, you know, our first line of defense is the masses. I don't mean to sound revolutionary, but hey, my family did help found the United States. No offense to the British, but... <laughs> <laughs> Love you. But my family were the first prisoner of war with the British. But I forget it. <laughs> Love all of you. Yeah. Okay, so uh, true. So I think we have to look at okay, we're, our civilization has come to this point, and how did we get here? And what is the next chapter? Well, the next chapter is here. The future has arrived. It's just that people a don't know about it, and b they don't know what to do about it. And and so that's why you know what, what gave impetus to the film. Serious. But yes, you, you know, your, your question is very, very spot on into questioning everything. Yeah, another question. Yes, ma'am. Um, where does nuclear fusion sit along this spectrum of new and free energy? She's asking about nuclear fusion. Uh, it can be done, and of course you've heard of uh, cold fusion, which actually yes. has happened. I, I Apparently Rossi in uh, Italy may have such a device. Um, that he won't disclose the mechanism of action. Huge strategic mistake. Anyone who knows Rossi, tell him to give me a jingle. You cannot do it. No. So, you know, if you're dealing with room temperature fusion or cold fusion, uh, it can be done. It has to do with, again, uh, very complex physics we won't go into here. But it's understood. What's more elegant are the electromagnetic systems where you, you know, this is 220, in America we have 110. Um, you know, if I'm zapping someone with a defibrillator, it's a little more. But generally, our electrical systems are running in low voltage, high current. If you flip it around, where you have very high voltage, very low current, and do the voltage at certain resonant frequencies, it opens a pointing vector, it's called, into the zero point <coughs> energy field. And this has been stumbled upon since the time of Faraday here. Okay, so uh, there's nothing new under the sun. The key is understanding the principles of the physics behind it. Uh, and, and once you have that, then you have to find people who have the courage to do it. Now, the, in the past, here's the problem, is that people have done this in a lab here and a lab there. I was just out in Las Vegas and I was meeting with a man who works for, worked for Lawrence Berkeley Labs, big uh, defense laboratory. Um, and he had worked on these projects. And he says, oh yes. He says, we've had these for many decades. And um, he says, but even people in his lab who on their own would stumble across this would have folks come in and say, stop this experiment now. The third highest uh, guy at the Naval Research Labs, which is the biggest Department of Defense lab in America, has been a friend of mine for many years, he spent time at my home. He, um, his group created a high voltage system that created lift, and he had these things floating across the hangar there across from Reagan National Airport. And the NRL, you fly, you see these big radar dome, that's where that is. After spending about a million dollars doing something that had been done by T. Townsend Brown in the 20s, 
and Werner von Braun for Hitler in the 40s and had been perfected in 1954 by the national security aerospace industry in America, a little help from British aerospace. This guy had a guy come in and say, you can't do this anymore, and they defunded it. He says, why not? He says, because we already have this elsewhere. So unfortunately, technology, you know, one of the myths of our society is that we live in a, a free society with a free market. Well, if you're taking the most important technology breakthroughs of the last hundred years and sequestering them into classified programs, that's not a free market, is it? Um, and who's benefiting from that? the usual folks who want to keep everything status quo, even if we destroy the biosphere. So yes, this kind of fusion you're asking about can happen. It's not the shortest path to this. The shortest path to this are the electromagnetic resonance systems that deal with the zero point energy field. By the way, a, a, a guy who wrote for your defense journal, uh, James Defense Weekly, we turned on to this issue. He wrote the book, uh, The Hunt for Zero Point, uh, Nick uh, Cook, I believe his name is. And, uh, Great book, recommended to, and uh, you know he discovered, and in fact, up until the early 50s, a lot of this was in the open literature in the aerospace journals, which also my uncle recalled. My uncle was the senior project engineer that built the funny thing that landed on the moon, the lunar module. You know what that is? Looks mm -hmm. like a spider. Mm -hmm. Took Neil Armstrong to the moon. That was my uncle. Uh, his his company Grumman became Northrop Grumman, and um, so this is an open secret with people like the head of the Lockheed Skunk Works, who told Jan Harzan, the IBM engineer you saw in the film, when he said, oh, we already have the means to take ET home. What did he mean? We already have trans-dimensional, fashion the speed of light technologies that are in the black projects, so-called black projects of Lockheed and in Northrop Grumman. We have them. Well, that's the good news. The bad news is, how the hell do you get them out to benefit humanity? Now, I think it has to be done in stages. The first stage would be something you're asking about. Something that would be an energy generation device that would bypass big utilities that your home car business could run on. What I had, uh, that have agreed with a colonel who is in charge of, here's a euphemism for you, future technologies for the Air Force, meaning the secret stuff they already have. They call it future, but it's not. It's back to the future. And I said, look, we want to do that first. And the stuff that flies, some of these things that you see that are UFOs are actually man-made, anti-grav stuff. Especially you go out to the, the desert southwest, the outback of Australia, Alice Springs, Dugway Proving Grounds in Utah, Pahoot Mesa, people call it Area 51, nobody calls it that. By the way, in the business, don't call it Area 51, no one calls it that. But those, those facilities have, at Edwards facility, they have all this. Now one of the things I put together for President Obama was an updated list of what I had given to Christopher Cox of the Congress and, and uh, uh, Bill Clinton and some of your leaders here. And that's a list of the facilities, project code names, code numbers, and specific projects dealing with this that date back, and they're still ongoing. So that actual intelligence is one of the things I wanted to give to the, the current President of the United States at the request of a man who set up his administration for him. A man who's in favor of disclosure. His name is uh, John Podesta. He actually put together Obama's cabinet. But the question becomes, they can find out about this stuff, but they don't have operational control over it. And so we're in a conundrum. I was talking to Chris Debney, who was here a moment ago, uh, about this at, at uh, the break. And um, well, we had a break. We didn't. Uh, <laughs> I've seen the film. He, and he, he, you know, we, we were talking about the fact that this is something where you have uh, a lot of people want to know about it. No one wants to do anything about it. Don't conflate the two. Knowing is not doing. And one of the most chilling moments of my young adult life, I'm a young medical doctor, and I start the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence, and then we started the predecessor for the Worldwide Disclosure Movement. It was called Project Starlight, which actually the Clinton uh, Presidential Library was forced under a lawsuit to release these documents. And I began to be invited up to Washington uh, to brief various folks, including uh, the CIA director. 
who later denied the meeting, but luckily I had documents proving we had it, and called him red, flat-footed in a lie. I always say, in Washington, how do you know they're lying? Their lips are moving. <laughs> <laughs> how did I say that? Awful. True, but awful. So, <laughs> at the end of this three-hour meeting, you know, I have this, this white paper that's in, in my first book. You can get it at seriousdisclosure.com. It's an e-book now. You can just download it. We're making them all available for like $4.99 right now. You just put it on, put it on your iPad. And in this, doc, in this document, it was a set of actionable executive orders for the president. And he looked at me. He's going out the door with his wife, who happened to be the head of the National Academy of Sciences, chief operating officer, anyway. And she looks at me and she goes, he looks at me and says, how do we disclose that which we have no access to? And I'm thinking, well, this is, you know, batshit crazy. You can't tell me the sitting CIA director doesn't have access to stuff that I heard about from whisperings in my aerospace family when I was nine years old. And he says, no, they're not telling us anything. So even after we gave him all this information, what happened is that he ended up uh, being basically strong-armed, and so did the president, and pushed. So the compartmented nature of intelligence is create a problem. And therefore, the solution is not Whitehall, or 10 Downing Street, or 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. It's us. Now, what I can say now that I couldn't have said 10 years ago is that we have documents, previously seized patents, that's all I'm going to say, under national security orders, and scientists who worked on this stuff, not whack jobs, that we could put together and do in a probably 18 months to 24 months or less, a buildup of an energy generation system that would prove that's at least a proof of principle prototype. We need funding for it. The purpose of this film is to raise awareness about that. Um, people say, why can't you just do that in your garage? I said, well, first of all, my wife has to hook up the DVD player. Up the DVD. <laughs> <laughs> so don't ask me to do that. I stick with defibrillators, respirators, and chest tubes. But the people who can do this, that so we tried providing about three quarters of a million dollars in grant funding to various scientists, as soon as they start eating close and they're working by themselves down near the Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville, they get a knock on the door and they get threatened. These high voltage electromagnetic zero point systems. Another question. Yes, ma'am. I'm not sure what your question is asking. I'm sorry. Um, energy systems, obviously, new electromagnetic energy systems. Mm -hmm. um, no, you, you were talking about Morning Star, and then you showed John Searle. And oh, well, these are people who are experimenting with these things. It was just to give people a sense of it. But is not. The same thing, the Morning Star? No. The no, they're all different. Um, and, you know, uh, Dr. Bearden, who's a physicist down near the Huntsville Space Flight Center, and I talked about there's at least 18 different ways to approach how you get energy from the quantum vacuum zero-point energy field. And people have stumbled across this over the years. Um, the problem becomes how do you go from the breakthrough where you have the aha moment to where you can then get the resources and get it out. And the average physicist and engineer are going to be able to do that. That's why there has to be a mass grassroots movement behind it, in my opinion. Uh, in order for it to work, and, and that's that's what we're advocating um, to do. Yeah. Yes, sir. We, we waste too much energy, especially with a thermal power plants, and produce low temperature waste heat. Can you tell something about utilization of waste heat to produce electricity? Um, I, I don't understand the question. I don't know what raised heat is. Waste, uh, waste, waste, waste. heat. Oh, waste Transforming heat. waste heat into electricity. Oh yeah, well there, there have been sterling uh, heat to electricity systems for years. Um, the efficiency isn't very high. Um, but again, you know, if you look at what was done with uh, a Stan Meyer, that was not a hoax. He actually had a car running on water. So you could take all the cars, adapt their engines, and they'd run on water 
by electrolyzing H2O, which are two burnable gases. And uh, no, because you would the, the effluent, the tailpipe is is water vapor, which you recirculate through a through a cooling. And so you're only pulling out the energy. Now, why did that work? The same reason why the barium titanate crystals at Lawrence Berkeley Labs that this man worked on, where you could put a certain voltage in at a certain resonant frequency, and you'd have 10 to 20 times more power out because they would begin to resonate and pull energy from this structure of space-time or the substructure in the zero-point field. So what they were doing with the water is that they were putting an electrical signal in, very high voltage. Unfortunately, he falsified the patents and took it to a grave exactly which frequencies, but there are two men who worked with him uh, that I know that we could put in our lab. And I think you could build that back up. So that would be what I call a transitional technology. It's something not that isn't just a free electromagnetic generator, but that would help transition all the internal combustion systems so we're not using oil, but using water. The other thing is that two-thirds of the surface of the Earth is covered with water. There's no shortage of water, there's shortage of potable water. But if you have free energy to do the electro electrolysis and create energy from water, and then you can do the desalinization using free energy and pump it, it's like what in the Bible it says, even the desert shall bloom. So uh, the, all of these are fixable problems, and, and I think that uh, it isn't going to be, you know, as Einstein said, no problem is ever solved by the level of consciousness that created it. So the dinosaur era of fossil fuel mentality and linear physics, or even quantum physics, isn't going to solve this. It's the post-quantum stuff that, unfortunately, um, is been classified. Uh, I remember a few years ago I was given a talk uh, at Cambridge, and there's a, an alleged high IQ group called Mensa. Uh, I, I tell people, alleged. We're still looking for intelligent life here, aren't we? Um, and uh, so they asked me to give a keynote, and I said, well, fine, I'll do it. So I go up there, and hundreds of people, and I give a presentation that's very, not like this, very here are the landing cases, here are the radar cases, the blah, blah, things that left brain linear, people who think they're smart but aren't, could get their minds around. Uh, <coughs> that's so direct, aren't I? Okay. Um, Academic, bony-headed, academic, academics, which is my family, but yeah, whatever. Uh, real brilliance is consciousness. Uh, and, and so anyway, so at the end of my presentation, there was this, this octogenarian who was on all these committees for the British government. And it was a professor of physics at Cambridge, and he says, Oh, fuck you know! If any of this were true, I would have known about it. <laughs> <laughs> Boing. You know, with infinite and perfect British bombast. And, um, love it. And, um, <laughs> I study it very carefully. How do we want really funny? Uh, and he went on to tell me he, that this is absolutely impossible and that uh, he had, was such an eminent physicist he would know about it. And, th and then he said, I find it utterly depressing that a man of your intelligence would be wasting your life on such drivel in front of hundreds of people. I said, well, with all due respect, if there's a 10% chance that any of this is true, it's the biggest change in human history. I don't think it's trouble. Next question. What, what, what was interesting, you know, afterwards we had sort of a banquet, one of those old halls with the torches, you know, and lit with, it was really beautiful. And, you know, the usual rubber chicken routine. And um, banquet. And, and I was late for another meeting, so I left, and I heard these people running after me. You know, I looked behind, and here are these young PhD uh, uh, sort of understudies for this professor. And he, they said, we want to apologize for Dr. I don't remember his name, so-and-so. And I said, that's okay. He said, they said, well, you scared him. I said, oh, I didn't mean to imply that these visitors were hostile. We know that they're not. That's just the poppycock of Hollywood and the UFO nuts. And he said, well, it wasn't that. He thought what you were saying might be true, and it meant that his whole career had been wasted, <laughs> and that the real action was going on in a classified world that he had no access to. I said, I understand. So they were sent to apologize for this guy. So what you find is that there is a future shock element to this, because we are 50 to 100 years behind the curve. 
And it, it's difficult to deliver this message. I have the dubious task of sitting on an island in the Great Barrier Reef next month. I've been invited to address 120 world leaders. Last year, the Director of National Intelligence for America was there. And I can't mention it beyond this, but to say that they've asked me to address them on this issue because they realize we're killing our planet. Mm -hmm. And the main focus is energy. So keep a good thought for us next month in Australia. So we're hoping that eventually a critical mass will be reached in the public, but also with some of these world leaders who, by the way, it's not like there's some vast conspiracy like so many people know about this. You know, you can walk through the E-ring of the Pentagon. E-ring is where all the generals and admirals are. Um, it's the outer rings they have to use. That was the site hit by the alleged plane that hit on 9-11. Anyway, um, or Rumsfeld and all those guys. Well, you could walk around the E-ring, and they're out of the hundreds of flag officers. There might be a couple who know about this. It's so compartmented. So people have a very incorrect idea about how government works, corporations work, and TSSCI, Top Secret Special Compartment in Intelligence. And when you, you know, Q clearance or nuclear launch stuff, well, this stuff is like 38 compartments past nuclear launch. It really is. And, and that's the problem, because in America, uh, <laughs> a couple years ago, I had some people who were sent over by um, uh, the president of France, Sarkozy, uh, his minister, Ministry of Defense had written a letter to me saying that they felt it was time for us to make peaceful contact with the ETs. Mm -hmm. and we did a little project there, a 2,200 acre estate in Brittany. Um, and uh, they tracked <coughs> objects coming over us on a vector at 200,000 kilometers an hour, and some of them stopping, and some of them transdimensionally shifting into the field. Amazing stuff. Now, the admiral who wrote to me uh, sent some folks over after this to meet with us in Washington. And they said, well, why can't the president or some folks in Washington just get this going because we don't want to leapfrog ahead of the U.S. defense establishment? I said, who? The emperor has no clothes. And I began to explain that in America, <coughs> we are now spending around a trillion dollars a year on the Department of Defense, CIA, Homeland Security, NSA, et cetera, trillion. The amount that is estimated, as you heard from Donald Rumsfeld 12 years ago, he said there's $2.3 trillion unaccounted for. Well, right now there's between 100 and 200 billion every year missing. My friends, that is larger than the defense budget of the United Kingdom or France or China or Russia that's in the black budget of the United States. It's an absolute disaster. And if you think that there's anyone in the Oval Office of Congress that has a handle on them, notwithstanding their assertions during the Snowden mess, you're in a fantasy world. They do not have a handle on it, not on this stuff. So that is the problem. It's a completely dysfunctional, broken system. And what I concluded before I went public with a lot of this at the National Press Club in 2001 was that the solution isn't going to be uh, in the leadership. It's going to be with the people. Yeah. We're doing disclosure. We're going to make contact. We're going to put these technologies together. We're going to bring them out. It's up to all of us. That's it. Mm -hmm. I'm very interested in these groups that you run mm -hmm. where people sit and they use their own energy to connect. I personally have connected on several occasions right. and really the communication system is respect and love. Correct. Well, and, and, uh, and know, understanding the nature of consciousness. I want to know, have you set groups up here already? Yes, there are. And unfortunately, you know, our app, you know, if you have a smartphone, there's a contact app you can download that has the whole remote viewing course, meditation course, uh, turns your phone into a magnetic field meter, the whole bit. It was seriousdisclosure.com. The one thing it's missing is a social networking component. And since we have no full-time staff, we can't do that for folks. What I'm hoping we can do in version 2.0 of this app is to get it linked into a social networking thing. So let, let's say that you're in Wiltshire. You can 
uh, get on there and people who want to opt in will be linked to you like you would on Twitter or Facebook or what have you. So we don't have that right now and, and we don't have any staff to coordinate people. So what I tell people is you can learn the protocols, practice them, and form your own group of three, four, five, six people. You don't want to cast the thousands anyway um, because coherence is hard to maintain once you go past about eight people. Now the training events I do, I used to do it with 100 people. Now it's cut to about 25 people. And even that is Promethean to keep 25 primates on the same page <laughs> for seven nights. I mean, the stars till 2 in the morning. I'm starting that on Saturday in Wilshire, oi. So, but, <laughs> but I think that you know, everyone can learn to do this. What, what's really key to this, by the way, this is the part of my work that's the, been the most defamed and least understood. And yet, the reason I was ushered in to brief the CIA director is because they knew that we had made contact. And they knew that in 1992, when four of these ET craft got vectored in at uh, Pensacola Beach. So I, th I think folks have to understand that this is something that every person can do. Why? Every person is conscious and sentient. Everyone has a beating heart. They can learn to be aware of just awareness. And when they do that, they can then enter into a silent state and intend to see remote places. And the research on this is very strong. Now, you know, the intelligence community have used this, and they call it remote viewing, uh, for spy purposes. Um, what I suggest is that we do it for universal peace purposes, that everyone consider themselves citizens of Earth, diplomats to other star systems. Because they're here. And what's amazing is that if you make half of a step in that direction, the universe is going to open the door to contact. And, the, and I think it's clear that, you know, I remember Larry King asking me, why don't they just land on the White House lawn? Oh, God, if I had one more person to be at, I said, well, this freaking White House. The White House in Bogota? Why not 10 Downing Street or Hyde Park or Kensington Palace? Say hi to the new babe, lovely. I think that there's, there's all kinds of things, but that's not how they're thinking. Because I tried that when they met with Eisenhower in 1954 at Muroc, near Edwards Air Force Base. A French government admiral, a military admiral, sent to me a document that proved that that event actually happened. But what did we do? Eisenhower lost control of what he famously called the military industrial complex. We then betrayed the whole initiative and it's been a disaster since then. So there too... Did he, did he make contact with them? Did he make any deals with them? Did there anything happen since No, there were no deals made, but there was an opening that happened that then went sideways. So where was and, the advice uh, from? And where were the... Where was the rights of extrusory from yeah. the right contact with them? I don't know what star system they were from. That's quite um, though, isn't it? But, but they were, you know, tall. The, the, the point I'm making... Right, and, like, and by the way, this was, this was right in the area this was right in the, please don't scream out. This was right in the area where Borden Cooper's team had filmed the landed craft, as you all know, in 1956. You all know the story. Mm -hmm. And Borden Cooper, the early Mercury astronaut, put that on a plane that was flown back to the Pentagon. So, you know, the, between the 40s and the 50s, particularly in areas where we were doing a lot of atomic testing, nuclear weapons development, and what is euphemistically called directed energy weapon development, which is how we shot down Roswell. Roswell did not crash. That was a directed energy weapon targeting. Uh, we've just discovered also that there was one in San Antonio, uh, New Mexico, not Texas, right adjacent to the Trinity site where there was a crash in August of 1945, uh, right after we had dropped the first atomic weapon on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So, you know, there's a whole history here that you have to kind of parse through and find people who know what happened. But the initiatives that had been taken, I think, went very bad uh, because the people who really took charge were people who were interested in the acquisition of power and were looking at this situation through military-colored glasses. And, you know, if you have rose-colored glasses, the whole world is pink. Um, so, unfortunately, I think that was the big mistake. The big mistake, and the military people have admitted this to me, was militarizing the situation from the get-go, which I think Eisenhower's instincts were to not do so, but by then 
later in his administration, he lost control of the issue, which is why he famously said in his exit farewell speech to the world, beware the military industrial complex, which will be a threat to our democracy and our way of life. And I think that's why ultimately it's all gotten passed on out of those very powerful circles into our laps, not my lap, um, heaven forbid, but all of us together. So what you're asking about, madam, very important. Everyone should take responsibility for contact. Everyone should take responsibility for gathering people together to support bringing out these new technologies and for disclosure. Uh, in uh, this city, there are dozens of military and intelligence people who know about this issue who should be invited to come out, uh, which is what we've done with the Disclosure Project. Uh, certainly there are a lot of British aerospace people who have known over the years. Uh, the people who know are usually your mid-level operatives and not necessarily your leaders. Um, and this I learned, as I mentioned, the hard way in America, but let me tell you a little story. We're in, forgot we're in Great Britain. Um, I just landed yesterday, so I'm quite jet lagged. Um, am I making any sense at all? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yes. I, there was, you had a Minister of Defense named uh, Lord Hill Norton, wonderful man, and a five-star admiral. They used to call him Sea Lords. And he had his home out, at what he called his cottage, out in uh, Hampshire. So he found out about what I was doing and invited me to come and, and meet with him at his home. And I said, certainly I will. And my wife and four kids were over here with me that year. And I said, go to Salisbury Cathedral or someplace and have fun. I have something to do. Um, life at home is interesting with me. Can you imagine being raised? Anyway, it <laughs> could have been easy to be raised this way. Uh, God bless my kids and six grandkids. Um, Seventh on the way. Oh, hey. Scary thought, you being a grandfather. <laughs> Can you imagine? Horrifying, really. Um, so, so, you know, here I am with, you know, your former Minister of Defense, who was head of MI5, MI6, military committee, head of the military committee for NATO. And he informs me, just as the CIA director, he says, I was never told anything about this as Minister of Defense. I said, of course not. He said, and he was furious and scared. And there's a private, I talk about this now because he's passed away, and um, I think on the other side he doesn't mind me talking about this. But he was really furious. He says, and he turned to me, he says, well, will you give me what you have been provided? I said, yes, and I brought him this 500 page uh, briefing document that uh, we put together for the president and folks. And, uh, the best that I could do in my spare time between shooting, stabbings, car wrecks, and heart attacks in the ER and raising four kids. But I said, look, <laughs> yeah. So I said, look, I'm going to answer your question with a question. What would you have done if you had found out that there was a deep national security state program that had engaged in assassinations, kept things secret from the constitutional appointed authorities, and had within their technology the, the, the means for getting the world out of poverty, pollution, and onto a sustainable track for thousands of years. He looked at me and said, I would have stood for one bloody moment! <laughs> he was like this tall, this steely blue eyed amazing guy, awesome. And I said, that's why they didn't tell you. <laughs> he looked at me. I said, they, the first thing they do before they let you into cosmic ops, magic ops, Magi, the document, though, uh, I could go through this whole document I have. <coughs> Blackjack control uh, is they do a soul biopsy. They look and see if you're willing to go along with the agenda of the secrecy. If you are, you may or may not be, like Bush Sr., CIA director, and you'll know. Or you may be like Woolsey and not know. You may or may not be a president that will be told a little bit to manipulate you into Star Wars, like President Reagan, I mean Reagan, <laughs> or you may know nothing and won't be told anything, like Bill Clinton, who ended up going to the Rockefeller Ranch to hang out with Paul Davids and this document I put together. And uh, a good friend of his says, yes, that document, she used to live at the West Wing of the White House with the family. She says he would, he would kept it on the back of his toilet and he would sit there going through it. <laughs> and she, he brought it out in the living quarters once. 
and was going through, and Bill Clinton was going through this thing, and it had all these documents and testimony from astronauts. He says, well, I know all this is true, but they won't tell me a thing, not a goddamn thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's from someone who lived in the White House, Bill Clinton. So it isn't as simple as people think. Everyone thinks there's this vast conspiracy. Well, yes and no, but the folks who are involved are not the usual suspects. Uh, Sometimes they are, usually not. It's mostly been corporatized, privatized. The real action, corporate. Lockheed Martin, my uncle's old company, Northrop Grumman, SAIC, MITRE Corporation, <coughs> Atlantic Research Corporation, on and on and on. We know who they are. Now, are there compartment operations in the intelligence community? Yes. In the Department of Defense? Yes. Are there some here in the UK? Absolutely. But it doesn't mean that your minister of defense or prime minister has been read into them, or briefed, they call it, read into the military talk. So I think we have to have a lot of open-mindedness and not come to facile conclusions about... <coughs> Whenever I meet someone, I take everything at face, it, it just, at a, at, 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 without prejudice. Because the, the person may or may not know. But I've learned the hard way that just because you're on the Senate Intelligence Committee, or men of MOP head, or a member of some royal families, doesn't mean you know anything. You might know, you may not know. And, and what we have to do is say, what can we put together to make this lift easier for them? Because ultimately, the very American idea, if the people will lead, the leaders will follow. And we're the people. Yes, you had a question here. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, one of the things I noticed omitted from the, uh, from the film... Oh, there's a lot. 99.9%. .9%. But one of, the, one, of the, one of the schools of thought that's out there, I'm not mm -hmm. saying I agree with it necessarily, is that there are... Um, that the government agencies have been in contact with extraterrestrials that don't necessarily have Earth's best interests at heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is the very popular position. And, and uh, my information is they'd like you to think so. Now, one of the confusions on this is a lot of these creatures that have been seen, how far into the deep end of the pond do you want to go here? Um, there's a whole section of this movie that was left out because the director felt it was too controversial as if the rest of this isn't. <laughs> but also, there wasn't enough time to go into it. Um, <laughs> that should be the next version. All right, there are five more versions of this, the 2.0, 3.0. Um, back a number of decades ago, they began to do it, uh, develop uh, creatures that look like their ETs and they're man-made. These are made at Dulcie, they're made at the Edwards Complex, at Alice Springs. And those are the ones that have been involved in electronic warfare systems, what the public call abduction simulations. Now, those are man-made systems. They have integrated circuits in their neural content. A number of years ago, when I started this, I didn't believe this, by the way, in the early 90s, and I began to meet people who'd worked in those projects. And I then had someone give me a strategic studies institute, very elite institute in America, document, that outlined the psychological warfare of creating the specter of at least one or more hostile ET civilizations, what Werner von Braun said, so that people would learn to hate. Now, if you understand how power is played, where there's been demagogues in religion, politics, warmongers, if you want to control the masses around something that is truly controlling, you use fear. And that is exactly what Adolf Hitler did and scapegoating Jews and what have you, and, 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 and other minorities, gay people, gypsies. So basically the agenda for about 50 years has been to create the specter of a threat from outer space. And to do that, they began to create systems that would be very convincing. Now in 1993, 94, when I discovered this, a man told me, if you tell people the truth about this, A, they're going to hate you, because people love to have someone to hate, and you can't take that from them. <laughs> and B, no, and B, they won't believe it because the truth is ten times more bizarre than the fiction that we're going to spoon feed people. And ultimately, that's my <coughs> biggest concern. 
I about a hundred times a week, my wife and I talk about shutting down all my efforts in this area, because in this whole subject, because so much of what I've done has been hijacked by people trying to make hay that there's a threat from outer space, which is exactly what Werner von Braun warned us about on his deathbed. The quickest way to do that is to portray that there are civilizations out there that are here to eat us for lunch. And actually, there was a Lockheed Martin group of scientists who just published a book two years ago to that effect. And why? Because how do you control the world? You know, as Leon Panetta said, we're spending $110 billion a year to chase 70 al-Qaeda out in Afghanistan. 70, 70. This is a quote. Go look it up. Leon Panetta, CI director that I... Uh, I know, who was uh, the CIA director, uh, who then became Secretary of Defense. So he was the first CIA director for Obama. And, and unfortunately, if you, you have to create this specter of fear. So I think there's a lot of disinformation out there wrapped inside the information that is trying to hit the aspects of humans that want to be afraid of something. Um, I remember some years ago meeting with the Crown Prince of Liechtenstein, Hans von Crown, von Liechtenstein. It was an amazing meeting, and he turned to me and he says, "The reason I'm providing funding to various groups looking into uh, the abduction issue is that and he was the chief funder of Opus Dei. Is that I really think we have to have an enemy in space." So we have a final eschatological end of the world battle in space that will force the return of Christ. Now this is the Crown Prince of Liechtenstein from his lips to my ears, and I'm going, whoo hoo, nuts, Bill. I mean, I'm going, really? You know? But remember, that family also funded Adolf Hitler, right? The, the Liechtenstein banking fortune. So I think that you have to begin to look at what is the agenda. On the other hand, if there was a group of civilizations, or a civilization, that wanted to do us in, it would have been done 1945 before we detonated the first atomic weapon. Now, I know my position on this is the least popular, because everyone does need to have some new entity to hate. And I think one of the problems with humans is that we've gone from racism, tribalism, misogyny, sectarian violence, where we're still there, and the next big thing is what I call exophobia. So, you know, forget homophobia, it's exophobia. Let's find someone new that we have to be afraid of. Now, there are people in the intelligence community who are all too happy to play on those proclivities and rather atavistic tendencies that are latent within humans to be afraid of otherness. And I think that we have a choice to make. And the choice is this universal peace or extinction. There's no way we're going to go forward from where we are now with international and intertribal and sectarian violence and replace that with interplanetary conflict. Now, who would benefit from there being interplanetary conflict? The usual suspects. The people who want to grow the trillion dollar defense sector into two or three or four trillion a year but also maintain, more importantly, it isn't the money, the power and control over people, because fear is the mind killer. So I would warn people, I, you know, to at least give, I know it sounds terribly 60s, give universal peace a chance. <laughs> and I will say one other thing about that. Let's say that that position is true, because I can't prove a negative. It's axiomatic, right? You can't prove a negative. Anyway. But <laughs> getting late, uh, going into my uh, scientific theory. But if you can't prove a negative, let's assume that there is, for argument's sake. I don't believe there's evidence. Uh, there's evidence for hoaxing and creating scary things that are these artificial life forms that look robotic, move like this, stand uh, Romanex footage. That's a programmed form, robotic. It looks like a gray. It's not. Um, we'll put them on an anti-gravity vehicle that we've been flying around since the 50s, and 99.9999999% of you would think it was an ET, and it's not. But let's assume there's one or two or three or four species out there that are. You're going to solve this problem down the barrel of a laser, or through a, a, a particle beam weapon, or electromagnetic weapon system? No. 
You're going to solve it through contact, dialogue, interplanetary relations, universal peace. And the recognition that the light of consciousness within everyone is a singularity, the singularity of mind. And so going beyond the duality and the conflict, because when you're dealing with civilizations that are faster than the speed of light, therefore are trans-dimensional, which means that they're dropping out of linear space-time, moving through another dimension <coughs> in a space-time bubble that can be created through very high voltage systems. If they were hostile, it would be point set match in a point oh one nanosecond. So you're not going to solve this problem through you know, jingoism and fear mongering and paranoia and, and, and creating another enemy. It, the, the solution would be the same thing I'm recommending with the CE5 initiative. Contact. And rather than sitting in your computer screens ingesting conspiracy garbage off the internet, I would suggest you go out into your beautiful countryside and make contact. That would be my recommendation. Yes, sir? Um, yeah, uh, regarding the little understood nature, true nature of reality, um, with regards to all in one, on one and all, Right. Um, I've gathered from watching your interviews online that you, you're well, very well versed in this, uh, in terms of interacting with people and changing your inner state right. to affect the other state. Right. Um, have you somewhat been initiated into these things by ETs? Um, I've had some interaction and they've kind of led me towards that. I, I think some of, some of what you're asking is correct. I, I, it's been augmented. The real breakthrough for me was because I was a dumb teenager that injured my left leg and then bicycled 200 miles in one day from Charlotte to the North Carolina coast. I'm a hopeless job. And it got terribly infected, and I had rhabdomyolysis, destruction of that muscle, and uh, I had a near-death experience. And so that near-death experience, uh, even though I was raised really a very devout atheist, <laughs> my parents, if it didn't go into a test tube, it didn't exist. So I had this experience of universal consciousness. You know, what Dr. Walter Russell, who mentored Tesla, the universal one. It was beautiful. But it was that, you know, there was an angry man sitting on clouds throwing bolts of lightning at us. Um, it was very beautiful. And then six months later, I was up on, in the mountains of North Carolina doing this deep meditation and had this amazing samadhi, pure consciousness experience. And when I was finished with it, there was an ET standing beside me who touched me on my right shoulder. And, uh, it's in the book, Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge, mm -hmm. huh? which is sort of an autobiography. But that's really how I got launched onto all this. But um, I, I felt that from the near-death experience, I, I was sort of a clean slate. I didn't have any preconceived ideas. A couple months later, I learned Vedic, a Sanskrit meditation and then began to continue those amazing experiences. And before I was a medical doctor, I used to teach people meditation. I would spend eight hours a day in meditation. And, and I think those were the things that really broke through. Um, I do think these civilizations, uh, they're interested in people who understand that the nature of awareness is that it is universal. That there's, you know, however many hundred people in here, but there's actually one consciousness phasing and refracting and emanating through everyone. And this has been proved scientifically. We just touched on it in the film. But I, what's, what's amazing is that everyone can experience that state. So we're, I'm, I'm not chauvinist about what kind of meditation form you use. But when the ETs know that you're in that space, that's the universal translator. Then they know that you're ready to be a diplomat to them. Not a diplomat the way we think of a diplomat. But because you're not going to be freaked out by the otherness of a different species, because you see the oneness and commonality of the clearness of pure mind. And so the clearness of pure mind is, to me, you know, where most people end on their spiritual path, I think is the beginning of being a CE5 ambassador. And, and, and they are very interested in interacting with people on that level. Now, one of the reasons for that is that, now this is what I have learned and postulated from my own experience, is that any civilization that can go from one star system to another, a priori, must know this because they have to have mastered non-locality, gone beyond linear space-time, but also when you go into trans-dimensional fields, you are increasingly in areas that are the so-called thought realm, consciousness realm. 
And their technologies, and, and I will never forget talking to uh, the CIA director's wife about this, because her first question was, how are they communicating if they're from a million light years away? Because if you use your, your iPhone, it takes a million years for a signal to get there and a million years to get back. And, you know, Andromeda Galaxy is two and a half million years, that's five million years, you're all dead. I said, no, they're not using the speed of light, they're using technologies that are interfacing electromagnetically with coherent, directed thought. Okay, and she looked at me, and this is like the Chief Operating Officer of the National Academy of Sciences, and she says, you know, I thought it had to be something like that. <laughs> I said, bingo, you know, there's more people than you can imagine who are ready to understand this. You know, this is, so I think that once we put this paradigm together properly, we will not only know how to make contact properly, peacefully, but it will redound to the benefit of, of all of us in, in terms of our own development spiritually and in enlightenment. Uh, yes, sir. I think the atheists actually come up with our, uh, like inside the, uh, from the outside. Hmm? Do you think the ETs come from our Earth? Well, yeah. as I mentioned earlier, there may be some that have been here a long time that may have subterranean and suboceanic. Um, Bush's uh, elders, science advisor, uh, told us that there was off here off the coast of uh, England, between the, uh, off of your uh, blah, 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 northeast coast, an area under deep underwater where they had uh, picked up ET vehicles coming in and out. Uh, mm. And uh, but it doesn't mean that that's where they originated, but they could have outposts there. Um, now a lot of people say, well, why should they be so discreet? I said because they know that we know, and that. If they were to do something massively overt, it would be spun by the spin doctors mm -hmm. in the military and in the media as an alien invasion. All right? If I figure this out with my limited intelligence, I know they have, because they're cruising around with IQs of four to 500. Um, and uh, frankly, uh, you know, we have to understand that they're waiting for us. The sign that we're ready for more open contact is when more of us are doing CE5, when we quit lying to each other about their existence, and we, when we start doing something constructive to stand down the weaponization of space and the uh, attempts to create a new enemy out there. So th those are things that they're wanting us to fix. And people say, well, can't they fix it? I say, well, I guess they could land here, but it would be no more successful than us going into Afghanistan to a medieval society and trying to institute Jeffersonian democracy. I mean, are you kidding me with this crap? I mean, you know, it doesn't work that way. In fact, the gap, the gap is even larger. So, you know, we're the children of Earth, and, and, and I'm sorry to be so blunt, but I do believe this is our responsibility to create universal peace, free energy systems, a just world, and a peaceful world and to disclose this information. Uh, it's not their responsibility. Now, if it, the backup position is that if, if there would, had to be something that came from that end, it would be under certain worst case scenarios, which is what we're trying to avoid. Okay, so I think it's really time for us to, to, to wake up and take responsibility for ourselves and our planet. And at that point, you're gonna see the, 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 the dimensions in the universe open up. And we're going to be open with, welcome with open arms with all these civilizations. But it's really our task. It's getting on to 11. I know we need to be out of here. And I want to thank you. We could go on all night. But thank you for coming. I hope